Hello Gamecock fans, I'm Spencer Ball. And I'm JP Barry. Welcome to Ball Don't Lie, SGTV's premier live sports show. JP and I will be giving you our weekly insight every Friday. This week on the show, we're talking college baseball in South Carolina. And later, the final four is set for the men's and women's NCAA basketball tournaments. And be sure to stick around for this week's edition of Head to Head Pickums. And without further ado, welcome to Ball Don't Lie. Following a tough loss to Georgia Southern in a midweek matchup, Gamecock baseball is going to look to bounce back in a key SEC series against Texas A&M this weekend. And Spencer, you know, it seems like just last week we were playing the number three team in the country. Uh, but <laughs> that's life in SEC baseball, isn't it? It sure is. It's a, a rotating crew of just excellent baseball teams at the top of this conference and the top of the nation's rankings. But it's games against Georgia Southern where you should look to get a win. And yeah. not only did the Gamecocks lose, they were shut out and held the four total hits on Wednesday. Meanwhile, for the Eagles, right fielder Sam Blancanto, two for five, two home runs, one of them being a grand slam, and five RBIs single-handedly would have outscored the Gamecocks. He almost he got half the hits the Gamecocks got. Just a horrid performance. Yeah, and it, you know, it's not going to get any easier going up against the Texas A&M lineup that's amongst the best in the country. Uh, I believe they have three or four hitters with OPSs north of one. Uh, they hit home runs like it's nobody's business, and they don't strike out. Uh, so it's going to be a tall task for Eli Jones and Tyler Pitzer. And, uh, you know, surprise, no Eskew, su yeah. surprise uh, to be announced. I don't know much about this guy. But, yeah, Tyler, um, Dylan Eskew was used in that midweek game, as was Ty Good. So we'll see if Roman Kimball makes an appearance. We haven't seen him in a little bit in terms of the starting role. Uh, but, you know, they're going to have to just throw everything they can uh, at this. And I feel like we're going to see a lot of uh, high score ball games this weekend. Yeah, it definitely would make sense. The Gamecocks have overall been pretty good at Founders. I believe 17-2 and at home. Um, but a place where they really need to kind of improve, JP, is when they have runners in scoring position. They often strand the bases. Yeah, and you know that you just miss out on opportunities to make it a better game and give yourself a chance to win. You, you just can't afford to do that, um, especially when you're going up against high-profile teams. Georgia Southern hosted a regional not even uh, two years ago. So, I mean, th this is a program that you cannot afford to take lightly. And, you know, I think that just it goes to show just, you know, South Carolina's schedule is tremendous. Um, and this is a good baseball team, but, you know, they just need to start getting into form. Yeah, they sure do. A guy who's um, really coming to his own as of late is Kennedy Jones. He's kind of been one of the bright spots of this lineup, and I don't know that people necessarily expected him to be, but he's really kind of got it into gear. Um, he's hitting 337 with five homers and 20 RBIs, and he's already, like, third on the team with hits with 28. And, you know, he didn't play every game, you know, so he has kind of some less opportunities than guys like Ethan Petrie, who's the team leader in hits, and Cole Messina, but he's right up there among them in um, how they're performing at the plate this year. So it's going to be, I think he's one of the, the key players to look for if this team's going to turn it around. And kind of, I, I would say bounce back, not that they've necessarily – you know, lost it entirely yet, but they, they kind of blew some games down in Tuscaloosa last weekend. Yeah. Oh, that was and then, brutal. you know, the loss to Georgia Southern. Got to look to take two or three against the Aggies this weekend. I agree. You know, you're on that teetering ground, and there's a great – no better chance to flip the script on how your season is looking with a, uh, a game or two uh, winning against a top-ranked team. Uh, and, you know, speaking of that – there's another uh, kind of version of that going on, but in the opposite in terms of South, the state of South Carolina. That's right. Clemson could stay hot in the ACC with a series win over Notre Dame in South Bend. In Clemson baseball, they just look like a bunch of juggernauts out there. I mean, this team is one of the best in the nation, and they're going to be really fun to follow all the way up until likely Omaha is what it's looking like. Well, you know, you never want to you know, count all your chickens before they hatch, but this is the best record through 28 games for the Tigers uh, since their last appearance in Omaha, and they run-ruled a very good USC Upstate squad on Tuesday after taking two out of three from Miami. And, you know, they're going on the road against Notre Dame. You know, the ACC is very, very tough. And you, you look no further than the fact that the Irish are 14-12, and 2-7 and seven in ACC play, but they're 27th in the RPI. And this is not going to be an easy match. Notre Dame's offense is one of the best in the country. They're uh, 29th in home runs with 46, 33rd in slugging percentage with a 5-1-2 mark, and they're the best fielding team in the country. 
the real downturn for the Irish, of course, comes uh, to their pitching. You, you know, you hear about how good this team is hitting wise, but uh, their starters have been miserable. As a team, they have an ERA of 6.7, which is 196th in the country, which is something Cam Canarella, uh, Blake Wright, Ostertop, you know, Clemson's lineup is very deep. Um, one thing Clemson has kind of struggled with has been their starters. And we get here, uh, Mark Howell, who had a good start against Miami. Uh, their, their rotation looked a lot better against Miami. Ethan Darden went six innings. Aiden Knack went seven with, uh, I believe, over ten strikeouts against the Hurricanes. Um, they're going up against a, a Notre Dame rotation that just, I mean, let's read out some stats here. Matt Bedford, a uh, 5-6-0 ERA in eight starts. Uh, Jackson Denny's, who isn't starting this weekend, but has a 15.5 ERA in four starts. Uh, Rory Fox has a, a 4.7. Riddell has a 2.96, but, uh, you know, it's, it's brutal. The big key, I think, is going to be uh, can Clemson's rotation kind of keep up that momentum going up against a lineup that does boost guys like T.J. Williams with a 1.138 OPS, David Glancy who has nine home runs at 31 RBIs to go with five hit by pitches, uh, and second baseman Estevan Moreno, uh, who has six home runs to go with Simon Bumgart. Uh, who has six home runs and 20 RBI. So this is a Notre Dame team that can bang their uh, field. Uh, the ball can carry really well there. Uh, but, man, I feel like just like Texas A&M, South Carolina, there's going to be a lot of high-scoring games. Yeah, that would make sense, especially if both rotations are struggling and both lineups are really stacked. But I tell you what, if Notre Dame needs a couple arms, I mean, we might be hitting the portal <laughs> here soon, you know. I think we could each give a like a um, – like a disaster f class, seventh and eighth well, inning. Well, it each. couldn't be worse than the seventh and eighth and ninth innings Notre Dame had in Raleigh against NC State. They went into the ninth inning with a lead in their last two games, and then they got they blew it and got walked off um, twice and, in a row. Is tough. And it was yeah, <laughs> it, it was tough. it was awful. Um, and you know that's 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 college baseball kind of in a nutshell because you go into that uh, weekend series, you're two and four. If you win those last two games, you're four and five. And 16-10 uh, and 10 on the season with a series win on the road against a top-20 team. Uh, but you end up getting swept because the back to the end of your bullpen just can't hang. Uh, and so, you know. I can throw a palm ball. Please cut me an NIL check. <laughs> well, I, you know, looking for Notre Dame baseball for NIL stuff may not be your, your best uh, iteration of uh, ideas. Hey, but, it might you know, not be. It, it should be a good week. You know, one of these games is on national television on ESPN2. So that should be kind of fun. Uh, Fox against uh, Darden, good starting pitch matchup. But, uh, you know, college baseball getting in the form, looking awesome, but we still have college basketball to talk about. And be sure to stay tuned for college basketball news right after this commercial. Last night marked the final game of the National Invitation Tournament, where the Seton Hall Pirates managed to knock off Indiana State and hoist the trophy uh, culminating one of the best tournament runs in program history, uh, none other than led by none other than Alamir Dawes, who was one of the best players on this team all year long. Uh, the transfer from the Clemson Tigers. That script, man, that script looks really nice. Sick jersey. Objectively it's super sick cool. jersey. Uh, but the Pirates defeated Indiana State in a in a barn burner thriller uh, last night. Their first NIT title since 1953, and their most wins in a season since 1993. And Spencer, you know. I don't know how much of the game you watched. Uh, oh, I, I kept up with it. I was, you know, texting JP. And we got a couple screenshots of um, the win probability there towards the end. And um, really nice closeout from the Pirates. Coming back from down seven again with 245 left. Uh, Dre Davis, you know, sealing it off with a layup with 20 seconds left. But the way they... They play defense against Robbie Avila they is just, incredible oh. because he's been one of, he's one of the best players in college ball this year, especially kind of at that, you know, non-power five level. Yeah, and, you know, for, he uh, had three turnovers as well. The Pirates forced 15 turnovers total in the game, which is just not what Indiana State wants to do at all, obviously. Uh, they wanted to speed the game up. St. Hall was able to slow it down. They blew up. Uh, Indiana State sets, especially down the stretch there, for some bad shots, which allowed the comeback. Um, and on that final possession, uh, they blew it up. They tried a desperation three, got their own rebound. Then Jaden Bediaco, the transfer from Santa Clara, struggled with foul trouble all night, but was in there at the end as the stopper, and he hit a block at the buzzer um, to seal the deal. Alamir Dawes, man, he was uh, tremendous. 24 points to go with four steals as he won NIT Most Outstanding Player. Um, he hit some key shots down the stretch. 
Uh, but it was Dre Davis, the spinning and slashing layup with 20 seconds to go to put the Pirates on top, 79-77. The transfer from Louisville, there was a lot of transfers coming together for this Seton Hall team. That's college basketball now. Yeah, but, you know, especially uh, with what Shaheen Holloway has been able to do with a very limited uh, NIL budget. And, man, Kadari Richmond was another player. He put up 21 points, 13 rebounds, five assists, a steal, and two blocks. He averaged 14 points a game, nine and a half rebounds, two and a half steals, and 35 minutes per game in the NIT. Uh, you know, just what, what a great performance. What a great run from this team. After, you know, both these teams got snubbed on Selection Sunday. That, that was where I was going to go. I was going to say, I know you know a lot more about Seton Hall than I do. You probably care a lot more. But what both of these teams showed us is that they deserve to be in the big dance. You know, it's great that one of them can bring home an NIT trophy. The other one put up a valiant fight. You know, Robbie Avila's getting appearances everywhere on Pat McAfee's show, you know. He's got a bunch of sick nicknames and, you know, probably looking to transfer somewhere else, you know, <laughs> which is completely understandable, you know, play at a Power 5 level, probably make a little bit more money doing so. But both of these teams, you're telling me the Virginia Cavaliers were more deserving. Or the Texas Longhorns. The Texas Longhorns. They actually did win a game. That's right. uh, let's, let's think of some teams who just stunk it up. Mississippi State got an, oh got an eight seed over oh these two God. teams. Uh, even Michigan State, who beat them comfortably, didn't have to, you know, didn't even have to play a play-in game. It's, it's just it's stuff like this that's so frustrating. But at least Seton Hall gets something to celebrate. Absolutely. They do I mean, bring home the NIT title. And it's going to be fun to see how um, – Sheen Holloway rebuilds this team. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces as, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of seniors on this team, but they go out on top. Dawes, Bediaco out of eligibility. Richmond does have eligibility left, but it wouldn't shock me if he went to the portal and went somewhere where he can get a big payday. Um, Dre Davis can come back, but he's been playing college ball for a while, and he's got a, a kid, and so he might want to just take a, a nice little chill pill, go out on top. Got to play in his home state of Indiana, his hometown of Indianapolis, in front of all his family last night, which was a very, very cool thing. Um, but, you know, my favorite part of the game was afterwards, Robbie Avila was, you know, obviously down in the dumps. Mm -hmm. He had a poor performance, and, you know, his team just barely lost after it looked like they had in the bag in front of their home crowd. And Shaheen Holloway, before anything else, he goes over to the Indiana State bench, and he tells him to keep his head up. He gives him, you know, a Literally pat on the back. Picked his yeah, chin picked up. his yes. chin up. Yeah. It's just, you know, two high-character programs, two great teams, just a that's what we want college basketball to be. It was just so much fun. And, you know, a when great it, uniform matchup. Great uniform. When it got to 77-70, I muted the TV. I started blaring music. I was like, I just got to generate some good vibes. And then it, the, was, oh. it was actually JP that scored the last layup. That's what it they was, don't tell It you. was, you know, whoo, whoo, spinning big, down big low. Big ESPN doesn't want you to know this. Uh, but, but, um, that's, that's enough of the JP MIT spiel. But, man, hey. Just what a performance by the Pirates. Oh, showing off the legs, too. There we go, hey, JP. What a just awesome. <laughs> go Pirates, baby. Yeah, you know, we, we've been keeping up with them year, you know, throughout the season, I should say. Um, so it's great to see them get a win, but that's not all the basketball coverage we've got. For our first game of the Women's Final Four, the Gamecocks face third-seeded NC State. And so far, South Carolina has just been the eternal buzzsaw yeah. um, in women's basketball. 36-0. They haven't lost since last year's Final Four versus Iowa. Dawn Staley, of course, is just racking up Coach of the Year awards. She got the Naismith and the AP um, uh, yesterday and then Wednesday. And then, you know, some haven't been announced yet, but... This is going to be a great matchup as they took down Oregon State in their last round, 70 to 58. NC State taking down one seeded Texas, 76 to 66. How do you think this one's going to shake out, JP? Well, you know, it's an NC State team that I thought was better than the three seed they got. They kind of uh, faltered a little bit down the stretch, lost in the ACC tournament title game. Uh, but you know, they, they proved that they should have been seated a little bit higher, I think, with this you know run they've been on. They've played some games that hasn't really even been that close. Uh, it, it's a team that really likes to play down low. Um, they don't exactly have the size that South Carolina does, but they do have the ability to hit jump shots, and they like to work inside and out. One thing that South Carolina really likes to do compared to NC State, NC State loves to get in transition. South Carolina likes to kind of slow it down a little bit, although they have been running a lot more this season compared to last. That's the big thing with the South Carolina team, right? It's just, a, a, you know, it's a... It's different parts, the same engine, and so it's running a lot faster up and down the floor. It's a lot more uh, ability to shoot jump shots. Um, I think these are two teams that are kind of similar themselves, uh, but, you know, South Carolina might just be 
a much better version. Oh, we, we'll certainly see um, tonight, actually, 7 p.m. It's Women's Final Four uh, game day here as both games will be taking place today. But NC State making their first women's basketball Final Four since 1998. And something to point out, Sanaya Rivers, arguably the second best player on this Wolfpack team, um, their point guard, um, was a Gamecock transfer, won the title with this team two years ago in 2022. And, you know, averages almost 13 a game, six boards and it's now going up against her former team, starting at point guard position, and she got a lot of playing time. It was her freshman year, but was it because Raven Johnson had a torn ACL, and maybe that was the reason um, she transferred schools, and now they're... Speaking of transfers, Haley yeah. Van Leff hitting the transfer portal yesterday. We'll see what comes of all that. Uh, but, you know, it's just gonna be, it's going to be interesting to see if South Carolina can get NC State off their game or if NC State can try. You know, NC State likes to cut inside a lot, and South Carolina's got, you know just the, the size and the ability to just shut that down instantly. But if NC State can kind of start playing their game a little bit, I think this one could be a real nail-biter. I think it could. And one thing last year that really ruined South Carolina in the Final Four, you know, it was another undefeated regular season. Undefeated all the way up until the Final Four, as we talked about against Iowa. The thing that really messed up South Carolina was foul trouble. Aaliyah Boston got in foul trouble super early in that Iowa game. They couldn't work down low, and after that, Clearly, that team really couldn't shoot jump shots. They I mean, didn't have the, a lot of shooters. The thing that's stuck in my mind, I'm sure it's stuck in Raven Johnson's mind as well, is you know, in that Clark literally waving her oh, off like that. Oh, and no one guarding her for like 50 feet whenever yeah. she'd get the ball at the three-point line. And that, you know, it's, you it's just a five-man circle like in the paint. There was nowhere to go. It yeah, was the so spacing tough. was terrible. And you know. I, Raven Johnson saw that. She hit the lab, and she's been great so far this she's year. She's upped her three-point percentage by over 10%, yeah, I which mean, is it's, ridiculous. It's really awesome to see. Um, so it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a lot of that. How can South Carolina, you know, respond when NC State starts making some jump shots? I think they can. It's going to be a great game. And then the other side of the women's Final Four bracket might be an even better game uh, as we have the highly anticipated matchup between Iowa's Caitlin Clark and Paige Beckers of UConn. And, you know, clearly these teams have more than just their two stars, but, I mean, these are two of the faces of college basketball at the moment. Paige Beckers, you know, she's dealt with injuries uh, for so long. She's finally healthy and going on one of these deep tournament runs. And then Caitlin Clark, I mean, what is there to say? I mean, I think, well, first off, just announced the AP National Player of the Year, so congrats to her. I mean, her stats are incredible. But I think before we talk about this game, we have to talk about the last game Iowa played against LSU. Not only for what a good game it was, but for what a historic game it was. The most viewed basketball game in NC um, in women's, AA, basketball women's history. basketball history. And the most, college, most viewed college basketball game, um, I think, ever on ESPN, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, because on mainline ES, yeah. Ma Magic and Bird is the most viewed college basketball game ever, but that was not on... That was on like ABC or... I, I think I... You network know, television, I mean... It, there's so many things, but it was more viewed than any MLB game last season. 12.3 million viewers, I think. And, and you know, absurd. one thing is that I wish people would stop making it such a comparison yeah. uh, with women's basketball and men's basketball. We're, we're getting two outstanding tournaments, two of the most viewed tournaments ever. It's the most viewed men's tournament ever. It's probably going to end up being the most viewed women's tournament ever. Uh, and, you know, some people just, we can't, they can't let it be like, this is awesome that we have this at the same time. It has to be, oh, the girls are better than the boys, or oh, boys are better than girls. Like, I think people just need to sit back and enjoy things a lot more. I've been watching women's college basketball for a very long time, since the Skylar Diggins days at Notre Dame, and to see it reach the heights that it has makes me so happy. And I just wish some pe more people, especially ESPN, could just sit back and just enjoy this more than just trying to tear down other things. It's, yeah, it's great to celebrate their achievements and show what a momentous game, especially this past one, was. But I agree with you that, you know, it's, it's not a comparison, I mean, why can't we enjoy both? Exactly. Why can't we enjoy and we both? are going to be enjoying hey, both hey, this weekend, ladies the and gentlemen. The cast of Ball Don't Lie, we just enjoy sports. I mean, that's why we're up here, you know. It's a little sweaty out here today. The sun's Boys. finally shining in South Carolina. But, I mean, it's uh, this is what sports is all about. I mean, it's just sitting back and watching the, the beauty of the game. And that's what we've had so far with both of these tournaments. And we'll get back to the actual game now. Yeah. Iowa versus UConn does feature two of the best, best players in the nation, Caitlin Clark versus Paige Beckers. I mean, this is must-watch TV. It is, and you know, it's, it's... And we will be watching. It's the blue blood, Connecticut, you know, going up against the new blood in Iowa. 
and it, it's all the fun mashups of that. It's just a lot of fun. Of course, you have Caitlin Clark, but this is an Iowa team that's very deep. They have a lot of people that can shoot jump shots, and you know, UConn also has Aaliyah Edwards. Um, who is one of the best complimentary players in the country. She scores 17.6 points per game, shooting nearly 60% from the field. And that's where this game is going to be big, I think, because, of course, Paige Beckers and Kayla Clark are going to put on a show. Absolutely. But it's going to come down to who can, you know, supplementally help their big star. And UConn has the size. UConn has a lot of shooters. They don't have a lot of people who can bang down low. Um, and meanwhile, Edwards uh, has that ability but, you know, Iowa can also make, uh, you know, I don't want to say make a fool of her, but, you know, kind of take advantage of that size difference when they're cutting. And, you know, Caitlin Clark is one of the best passers as well as shooters in America. And, and she, she draws can, so much attention. And, uh, you know, a lot of space. someone's going to be open. And yep. so I think it's just going to be a lot of fun. And I'm, I'm very, very, very excited yeah, for this game. Yeah, some things I want to point out. Um, there is all but one rotation player for Iowa that averages at least 36% from three. That's, you know, you double Caitlin Clark, someone gets to the corner. That's pretty good odds right there. But one thing to note is Iowa's a lot deeper than UConn. Yeah. UConn is kind of running an Iron Woman lineup, if you will. Like, very few substitutions being made. They've had so many injuries, which is a, a testament to how good they are, and they are still made it this far. But, I mean, in that game against USC, I think... Was it, did all five starters play literally I, the entire I, game? Because or close to it. It was very close. I know Paige Beckers is putting up 40-minute games. and <laughs> She's the Jalen Brunson of women's basketball. I mean, just, <laughs> there is no break. So this team, as well-conditioned as they are, I don't know if any offense in the country makes you work as hard as Iowa does. They're going to set screens. They're going to be moving all over the place. And as tired as UConn gets, Iowa can say, hey, let's, let's get a couple bench players in. Let's, yeah. get, let's let our best player get a breather while your best player is out there huffing and puffing, fighting through I would, screens. I wouldn't want to be the idiots to have to choose a winner between these two later. Oh, oh, that, that would totally stink. Oh, no. Yeah, well, Pickums are coming later. But uh, moving on a little bit in the men's tournament, Purdue takes on yet another NC State basketball team as the Wolfpack are in the final four of both tournaments as well as the UConn Huskies. We've yep. got some repeat offenders here. Um, very, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool to see. You got to you yeah. kind of Oh, absolutely. And, you know, how could we not invoke Jim Valvano in the 1983 NC State Wolfpack here? Uh, they're 26-14. and 14. It's their first Final Four appearance since 1983. And they're led by the big, the big mound of everything, DJ Burns. Big man. smooth, man. Hey, big smooth. He's light on his feet. He can bang down low. He can get bored. He can dish it to the open man. He's out there like Escalade, scoring about 20 a game. And, you know, <laughs> supplemented by guys like DJ Horn, Jack Taylor, Michael O'Connell. I just, I, hey, I love this team. And when they dug deep and they went on that 12-2 run to take control of the game versus Duke, I mean, that just felt so special. But, hey, Purdue has gotten here historically as well. It's their first Final Four since 1980. They're led by a big man, Zach Eady, who, I mean, is just the going. The biggest man. <laughs> in the NCAA Goodness. tournament, he's averaging 30 and 16 with two blocks to go with Fletcher Lawyer, who's one of the best three-point shooters in the country. They trailed in that t Tennessee game early. But, man, they came back, and they are a team that has never won the NCAA tournament. And let me tell you, there's another guy not mentioned on that graphic for the Boilermakers. Braden Smith is just a little <sighs> ball of electricity. Yes, he, he is. He just rolls their offense. He just sprints around. Like, you'll just see him. He's First off, he averages over, like, six rebounds a game for a little, <laughs> like, a short little white dude. And you just see him just, he's always Is the always matchup of the moving. century going to be Braden Smith versus Michael O'Connell? Uh, uh, Cerebral players, man. I can't wait to watch it. Great passers. They do everything, literally everything for each respective team. It's. I think this is going to be such a fun matchup. It's either going to be a fun matchup or Purdue wins by like 40. Well, that's a, I, know, I was going to say, I hope the refs let it be a fun matchup and they I don't do. get DJ Burns in foul trouble instantly. Yeah. But, I mean, it, Ben Middlebrooks has, has had his moments coming off the bench in this tournament. It's an NC State team that during the regular season – I mean, they had no one who was getting going, and now it feels like everyone's getting going for them. And I mean, if they didn't win the ACC tournament, they are not here. They, 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 may, they may not have even made the NIT. They were 17 and 14 going into the ACC even tournament. Even if they made it to the championship game of the ACC tournament, I don't think they would have made this tournament. Maybe they would have been given an NIT bid, but that yeah. still would have them at like 20 and 20 and whatever. Like, it was... 
20 and whatever. I mean, that's, that's great. But I mean, <laughs> they really didn't have a great regular season, and that's why this is such a miracle run. I mean, an 11 seed going all the way back to the Final Four, when, I can't remember the last time it happened. It was UCLA. UCLA, uh, with, just a couple uh, Johnny Juzang. Yeah. Yeah. Kama Haquez Jr. Yep. And uh, what's that guy with the Afro who played at UCLA forever? T Tiger Campbell. Tiger Campbell. And then a couple years before that was Loyola Chicago Ramblers. So we've seen an 11 seed in the Final Four, but what we haven't seen from them is much success. Yeah, and you know, so, UCLA was close. Jalen Suggs ripped their heart out. Oh, man. Um, One of the, the greatest tournament games maybe ever. That was, I remember watching that. And so I'm just, you know, it's the matchup of styles in this game because obviously Purdue's going to feed Edie, but they pass the ball around a lot. They're always running some court, some sort of set. NC State's the opposite, man. They're going to get it to someone, and they're just going to let him work. It's very high, so heavy. And right now they've been getting it to the hot hand, which is that left hand of DJ Burns. And truth be told, I mean, it's I don't like think LeBron used I don't think Zach Eady can guard DJ Burns down low, but we're going to see. It's going to be very interesting because, of course, DJ Burns might have 100 pounds on Zach Eady, but Zach Eady is about nine inches taller. <laughs> and, and has the power of the stripes on his yeah, side. Yeah, because so. they said, uh, I saw a report that said DJ Burns is listed at 6'9", but he's probably about 6'7". DJ Burns is getting looked at as an NFL like offensive tackle prospect. He might, go to, he, might, he might do independent workouts after potentially winning it all in March Madness, which is the craziest thing ever. But it's going to be so much fun. And again, it's not the only game we've had. UConn is another team in both tournaments. They're up against Alabama and the Crimson Tide for a trip to the Men's National Championship. And I mean, so far. UConn is, they're scary. I, I was going to say, not to mince words, but it could get, uh, it, it could get tragic for the Alabama Crimson <laughs> Tide. You know, Illinois is a team a lot like Alabama. They're an all gas, no breaks, all offense, no defense type team. And Illinois hung with the Huskies for a half. <laughs> and then a 30 to nothing run <laughs> by UConn uh, kind of buried them. And truth be told, Alabama ain't got Terrence Shannon Jr. To, to be a fly in that locker room, when Dan Hurley was given whatever hap what, whatever he did at halftime, like it might have killed the flies. They might they maybe were just sitting scorched there earth, shaken to death. And they're coming into this Final Four after getting you know screwed by the airlines. I mean, hey, let's just say tomorrow it could be a bad day to be a, a member of the Crimson. And that's not to say they can they can score. Marcus Sears has hey, been. We both counted them out. We both had them losing to the Kooks, and and then they should have lost to Clemson. Uh, but, you know, Clemson couldn't make a free throw to save their life, something UConn can most certainly do. But, you know, they've won, what, 13 straight tournament games by double digits, UConn has. And, I mean, just good Lord. <laughs> That's it, about all you can say with this team. They are just, they look unstoppable. I mean, they just dominated Illinois from the whistle in the second half. Alabama, they picked up a bunch of gritty wins. You know, that Grand Canyon game was very physical. It, it was chaotic. I mean, it was crazy to watch. They took down Clemson. Um, they took down UNC. I mean, they've taken down a lot of good teams, and, you know, they just kind of get by. UConn... You can't get by UConn. It, it's not going to be that way. When UConn has lost this year, they lost on the road. Kansas shot like 60%. Yep. They lost on the road against Seton Hall. And, on you the know, road to Creighton. And, they, and Seton Hall shot like 45% from three. And they lost on the road to, to Creighton, who shot the lights out. You have to have the best, like... You have to play a perfect game. A perfect game at home and just hope to God that the Grim Reaper still doesn't get you. Can Alabama play a perfect game? Can they defend Dominic Klingon down low with a guy who looks like he just, you know, walked out of an Alabama trailer park? I mean, we will, <laughs> we will find out tomorrow. But, JP, my inclination is no. But that's all we've got for you today. We'll be right back after the break with this week's Pick'ems to wrap up this episode of Ball Don't Lie. Welcome back to Ball and Live Pick'ems. At the start of week seven, Spencer has 39 wins and 31 losses, while I set an even 35 and 35. We're going to go through the women, men and women's final four, and then we'll just throw out whoever of those two we pick we think will win the national title, which happens on Monday night um, for the men and Sunday afternoon for the women. And, of course, we'll be covering that the following Friday, of course. Absolutely. I and mean, starting with the women's tournament, we've got NC State versus South Carolina. Spencer... Who do you got? I'm taking the Gamecocks here. Of course, I mean, they haven't failed me year long. And I think this team is, 
I think they're too good. I mean, I think NC State is really going to put up a fight. I think fight. it's a close game. And if they shoot the ball, I mean, South Carolina's played in close games in this tournament. You know, they let Indiana get back into it, and it was because Indiana ran a lot of motion and got open threes. So I think NC State might use a similar strategy, get Isaiah James going from three. Then I think it becomes a close game, but I think down low, South Carolina is too big and too physical. I, you know, you took the word right out of my mouth. I'm also going to take the game, Cox. Now we have, I mean, the heavyweight bout of the century. UConn against Iowa. Who do you got, man? I think this this might sneaky be the best game in the tournament. I think it's going to be I don't great. think it's sneaky. <laughs> it, well, it might not. You know, that's it a, sneaks up that's on someone like DJ Burns point. sneaks up on a pizza in. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I'll take Iowa. <laughs> that's, um, I, I, think, I think they get it done. I think it could set up a, a rematch between South Carolina and Iowa. Frankly, I'd like to see that, but it might also, like, I'll be sitting in the chair, like, just about to, like, internally like, explode out. the entire time. Um, who do you got? I, you know, I think it's back and forth. I wouldn't shock me if both teams hit the century mark in terms of points. Uh, Honest to God, these are two of the best offenses in all of college basketball, men's or women's. But I think big-time players make big-time plays in big-time games, and boy, howdy, is Caitlin Clark a big-time <laughs> player. And I, I think we both have South Carolina, Iowa, and the national championship, a rematch for that Final Four. Spencer, your national champion for women's college basketball. And JP, we sit on the beloved campus of the University of South Carolina. If I were to say Iowa wins the national championships, I might be beaten to death as I leave the studio. Rocks thrown at me. Um, yeah, you're paraded cops. around the horseshoe by your entrails. It's South Carolina. It was always the Gamecock. It was always the Gamecock. Gamecock National Championship. And of course, SGTV's in Cleveland. Shout out Dakota. Shout out George. George Keep yep. up with our channel. Because we're going to have coverage. coverage from tonight's game. And if we win, Sunday's when game we as win. well. So, woo. That's wood. Knocking on some wood there. But I think it's going to be a great tournament, but I think South Carolina brings it home. They've been the best team all year long. Uh, moving on to the men's game, starting off NC State versus Purdue. I'm hesitant to ask who JP has winning this one, but I'll do it anyway. JP, who you got, buddy? For the, you know, the umpteenth time in this tournament, all I can say is... Go State! All right. Um, yeah, I think NC State, this is a miracle run. And they have to shoot. The thing that's come out to me the most has been not only their ability to make threes, but the yeah. ability to force other teams to miss threes. Teams have missed some open shots. But NC State's defense on Kimpom has literally risen 25 spots in this NCAA tournament run. The defense is all there, and if they can shut down the supporting cast, can Zach Eady score enough to keep up with the NC State offense? See, that's the thing. I, I think he can, and I think the officials are going to, and that's, it's sad. It's it sad is that sad. We have to mention it, but I think they are going to play a factor. So it'll be interesting, um, but I think the magic continues. <laughs> I think NC State knocks off Purdue. It, it, I mean, I might be disowned after doing this on camera, but I think NC State wins because I think if they force the supporting cast of Purdue to not have a good shooting night, they just find ways to win. I, I don't really know how it happens. <laughs> NC State's either going to win this game by like two to four points or lose by 30, and that's, that's what I think. But I think NC State, I think they just might get it done. Bama versus UConn, who you got in this one? I mean... The Yukon Huskies. I it's gonna be slicing and dicing, you know, toasting and posting. It's not going to look good for Alabama. It might be close for a little bit. Alabama has that kill switch that can flip and score 15 points in a row. But can they stop Yukon for 40 minutes? I don't think they can stop Yukon for four minutes. I think Yukon's <laughs> gonna waltz their way to another national title appearance. Yeah, I think Yukon is gonna take down Alabama. They're they're too good. It's they they really. I mean, I mean, Alabama could shoot the lights out and keep it close the whole way. I think UConn's defense is too good. They're too physical. They close out too well. It's going to be really tough. And that has a UConn NC State title game, which I don't think. Uh, I think only NC State students had it this way. <laughs> not even way. Uh, the NC State student I know did not think this would happen. But oh, um, I mean, I don't think anyone thinks that. But it's like we're South Carolina students. It's like well, you got to make a bracket with the Gamecocks winning it all and. Well, and on the other side, it might, might as well be UConn. JP, in your national title game, who do you have bringing it home? You know, you look into it, and it reminds me a lot of a certain year. 
a certain year of the 19th or of the 20th century in the 1980s and it took place in the year 1983 you had an NC State team that had to go on a run to win the ACC tournament to even make the NCAA tournament they were a low seed it they sounds it sounds a little familiar they went on this huge run against a lot of teams they beat some very good teams and they even beat a team in the final four that hadn't been there in a while and was very talented had perhaps the best player in the country then they got to that national championship game and played against the unquestioned best team, Five Slamma Jamma, the Houston right. Cougars, the 1983 Houston Cougars with Hakeem Olajuwon, a big man who could do it all. And I believe Clyde Drexler was on that team as well. Yeah, I, I mean, mean that was, was a team. Anyone, anyone in the world would have thought you, uh, Houston waltzes to a just, uh, you know, you, Houston had beaten everyone in the tournament by a million points. They had barely lost all season. But Jim Valvano and the NC State Wolfpack, they dug deep. And they did not give up, and they, and they found a way, and they continued the magic all the way to the end. And I think Kevin Keats, I think DJ Burns, Michael O'Connell, Ben Middlebrooks, Jack Taylor, DJ Horn, all because of one miracle shot against Virginia, they're here. Why not then? Why not the Wolfpack of NC State winning the national championship? Spencer, your rebuttal. You want me to tell you why not? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, that little bald man sits on the sideline of the Yukon Huskies. I mean... I love Danny Hurley. Dan Hurley is... He's a legend. I love Dan Hurley as well. Frankly, I don't think he believes in miracles. He believes, oh. he believes in defense. He believes in basketball. <laughs> he believes in halftime speeches that'll make your toes curl. And I think the Yukon Huskies, it doesn't matter who they're playing. I think they win it again because they're just that good. They're and just as much as the NC State Miracle Run would be amazing to witness, I think they fall one game short. Now I think it's the UConn Huskies bringing it home. But JP, that's going to do it for this episode of Ball Don't Lie. And funnily enough, last week's going to be next week is going to be our last episode of this semester. Don't cry, we'll be back in the fall. But you know, be sure to check Probably that at a out. New time. <laughs> that, uh, more to more to come on that. Be sure to follow us on Instagram X and Facebook at SGTV at USC. And to keep up with all of our content, be sure to also visit us online at SGTV at USC.com. For SGTV, I'm JP Barry. And I'm Spencer Ball. From all of us here at SGTV, have a great weekend, Carolina. Forever today.